Hey everybody, I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust and I'm standing on the Carnifex Ferry Battlefield uh, here in West Virginia. I mean, you can name it whatever you want because it's Carnifex, Carnifax, Carnifex. Uh, we also have Pearson's Hollow behind me or Patterson's Hollow. We have the Patterson House or the Patterson House, depending on who you read. So there's all kinds of different names for battles. Um, so if you know, study the Civil War long enough, you're going to learn that there are a lot of different battles or names for a lot of different battles, not just Second Manassas or Second Bull Run. Sometimes they didn't even know how to spell the name of the battle. But we're gonna call this Carnifex Ferry. Um, this is a September 1861 battle here in Western Virginia, if we're standing here in 1861. Today in 2020, it is uh, most decidedly West Virginia. This is a state park here in West Virginia, founded in 1935. We're standing on uh, the battlefield or Carnifex Ferry uh, overlooking the Union uh, position here. This is one of our federal batteries that would have been positioned here on Carnifex Ferry. Um, and before we can get to this battle, we need to talk a little bit about what is happening here in Western Virginia in um, uh, mid to late 1861. Then we're gonna walk around this battlefield and we're gonna finish up over on the Confederate side of the works, uh, heading down towards the Laughing Gully River because we are high above the Gully River. Confederates here in West, Western Virginia seem to pick the highest points to be attacked upon. They usually put their backs to a river uh, whenever they're fighting like places like Corix Ford or others. But here at, at Carnifex Ferry, they seem to do both. Let's put ourselves on a high ground, surrounded by a river with only one exit. This is really good strategy, and we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. But to get to Carnifex Ferry, what we need to do is back up to uh, April of 1861. Very quickly, if you've not seen our Corix Ford video or our Philippi video, please head over to our YouTube channel or our Facebook page and check those out. But what happens in 1861 is that after the firing on Fort Sumter, Eastern Virginia, as we know as the state of Virginia today, um, they are going to start pushing for secession. And on, on uh, April 17th of 1861, those ordinance of ordinances of secession uh, will start to be pushed forward. But it's going to take a vote by the Commonwealth of Virginia six weeks later to officially show that Virginia is seceding from the United States. Uh, so that is what's going to start to happen in Eastern Virginia. In Western Virginia, when this talk of secession comes about, some men like John Carlisle, Francis Pierpont, uh, Arthur Borman, and others are going to get together and start to say, no, 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 we want to stay with the United States. And guess what? When we stay with the United States, we're going to be the real state of Virginia, not those f fake guys over there in Eastern uh, Virginia. So it's going to turn into uh, some heated rivalries here. But as the Confederacy starts to see this new state starting to break away in uh, April, May, and into June of 1861, they know they have to counteract this move. So what do they do? They start sending armies up into Western Virginia. The uh, Union Army will do the same thing. There'll be battles at places like Philippi, uh, Rich Mountain, uh, Corix Ford, and nothing seems to be going right for the Confederates. It's one commander after another. Uh, you're you're going to have George Porterfield defeated at Philippi, uh, Richard Garnett and John Pegram defeated at Rich Mountain. Garnett, I'm sorry, Robert Garnett defeated at Rich Mountain. Robert Garnett killed at Corix Ford. Now we send a new commander out there na under the name of Jackson, not Stonewall Jackson. He lasts a few days. William Loring comes out here, and then eventually we get a guy that everybody knows, and that's Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee is going to come out to Western Virginia uh, and take over just a hodgepodge of personalities and Confederate forces, which will include William Wing Loring, who, who is not a West Point graduate, but does have a lot of military background. He actually outranked Robert E. Lee in 1861 when they both left the old army. You'll have two former Virginia governors, Henry Wise and John Floyd. These former governors are going to have a civil war in amongst themselves. They hate one another. Uh, and John Floyd will be our primary commander here at Carnifex Ferry for the Confederacy. Uh, and trying to coordinate this will be Lee. We're going to try to go up the Elk River uh, to a place called Elkwater. We're going to try to go up to a place called Cheap Mountain and attack there. Things don't go well because nobody seems to be listening to what Robert E. Lee has to say. Lee's not taking a firm hand here. And John Floyd, as we'll find out here at Carnifex Ferry, is going to do whatever he wants. 
Floyd in August of 1860, uh, 1861 will arrive uh, in the Gallee River area uh, down near Gallee Bridge. Uh, there'll be a Union force down there under the command of Jacob Cox. Cox is an Ohioan. He has no military background. Uh, John Floyd, though, oh, I'm sorry, I should say Cox does have some militia background, but really no military background. John Floyd, former governor of Virginia, former secretary of war for the United States under James Buchanan. Uh, and he, while he has been in charge of uh, the War Department, Floyd has, you know, been near treasonous before the war, kind of sending arms to the South and doing some shady uh, offerings uh, of business deals while he sees the war clouds starting to come across uh, the United States. Floyd will eventually uh, decide to join the Confederacy, becomes a, becomes a general, is shipped down to Western Virginia, where he's going to meet up with his old political rival, uh, Henry Wise. Wise is going to tell him, hey, man, you know what you should do? You should stay behind some of these great rivers that are around us. The closest river to us is the Gauley River. The Gauley River sits on some high bluffs over in this area of Western Virginia, about 38 minutes by car today from Gauley Bridge. Um, and what he's going to do, what, what Wise is going to say is, there's a substantial Union force near Charleston. There's a substantial Union force near Clarksburg. You should probably use the river as a defense. And John Floyd says, that's a great idea. I'm crossing that river anyways. So he's going to cross the river. John Floyd will in August of 1861. And he is going to cross here at Carnifex Ferry on August 22nd, 1861. He's going to use one of the three ferries that would get you across here. There's Brock's Ferry, another ferry that's escaping my mind uh, right now. So there's not a lot of crossing points across the Gauley River, which is very mountainous country. He decides he's going to push forward and start to engage with some Union forces um, that are trying to keep a tenuous um, communication line between Charleston and Clarksburg open. Uh, you'll have a lot of Ohio regiments out there, the 7th Ohio, which we talked about at Kessler's Cross Lanes, the 23rd Ohio, which has two future presidents uh, in it, Rutherford B. Hayes and William McKinley, as well as some other Ohio units. But Floyd decides he's going to cross, pick a fight. Things go well at Kessler's Cross Lanes on August 26th, uh, but now he's given away the fact that he's on this side of the Gauley River. He's on the Union side of the Gauley River. And what ends up happening is... William Rosecrans, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, is going to move from Clarksburg. Jacob Cox will start to move some men up into this direction. So you have two Union forces starting to march towards this part of Western Virginia. And now John Floyd, rather than pull back across Carnifex Ferry and back to the south side of the Gauley River to use that natural defensive barrier, he decides to set up a defensive line. Uh, not too far from where I'm standing, you'll see the William Patterson or Patterson house, depending on who you read. Um, and up on a tree line, he is going to set up about 17 to 1800 Confederates. These Confederates are under Floyd's command. They're going to put up fortifications. A lot of people talk about, oh, it's only open field fighting during the American Civil War, the first few years. No, there are actually fortifications that are here. Union Army talks about bombarding them from the hill that we were standing upon and knocking the rails and logs into pieces here at Carnifex Ferry. But that line is only gonna span for about 350 to 400 feet because as we stand, um, I'm facing towards the Union line, the Gully River actually is going to wrap up and around me. So the Confederate flanks are both roughly anchored on some steep bluffs over the Gully River, but unfortunately for the Confederates, there's only one line of retreat with 7,000 Union forces coming towards them uh, under some very, eventually, good Union commanders, or at least solid Union commanders. Now, Carnifex Ferry, for most people, is famous because of the 20 to 25 current and future Confederate and Union generals who serve here. And we'll Nate, rattle a few of those off as we go along. But um, the battle itself will start to start to take shape with Rosecrans in early September moving from Clarksburg. We now have men moving up from the Charleston Gully Bridge area. And now they're converging on John Floyd. Now, as all this is taking place in September of 1861, Robert E. Lee's coming up with his cheap mountain battle. He's coming up with a drive up the Elk River. So there's a lot of moving parts here. And if the Confederates are victorious, moving up and taking Cheap Mountain, if they're victorious at the Elk Water, if they're victorious here at Carnifex Ferry, they could potentially drive north towards Wheeling and throw off that usurping Virginia government that's starting to take shape 
in Western Virginia. That's what they could do. Uh, long story short, that's not going to happen. So now the Confederates who were camped up here on Gauley, which they're going to call Camp Gauley, uh, named after the Laughing Gauley River, um, they're going to start to uh, have, you know, what every Confederate force that starts to deal with in Union force, and that'll be disease. These are men coming together for the first time during this war, and as they come together for the first time during this war, measles, the common cold, diarrhea, will start to claim the Union and Confederate uh, souls. Uh, and over here is a, a marked grave, not to a soldier who was felled at the Battle of Carnifex Ferry. This is a gentleman uh, by the name of Granville Blevins of the 45th Virginia Infantry. The 45th Virginia Infantry is currently commanded by Colonel Henry Heath, eventually. General Heath, that's one of our future generals up here. The Blevins will die just a few days before the Battle of Carnifax Ferry. So if you get up here on the Carnifax, you'll find out that Blevins' grave is here, but he is not one of the Confederates to die in the battle. He dies of disease. There are other Confederates buried up here, most likely uh, claimed by disease and the battle, but Blevins is the only grave that's marked up here. So as we walk forward, what we're going to start to see on September 10th of 1861, Union forces are going to arrive in this area and we're marching in the footsteps of right now the 10th Ohio Infantry. Uh, the 10th Ohio Infantry is part of Henry Benham's brigade. Henry Benham at the Battle of Corks Ford, which you talked about um, in one of our earlier videos, which took place on July 13th, 1861, has now gone from captain to brigadier general. There's one of our next generals. Benham is commanding a brigade of infantry, and the 10th Ohio Infantry will be out in front, about six companies of them. They're going to be the feelers for the Union Army, and as they go forward across this battlefield, or what is becoming a battlefield, they're going to go up towards the Confederate line, and they're going to receive a volley uh, from the Confederates. And that is going to tell uh, William Lytle, the colonel of the 10th Ohio, that the Confederates are here, and the Confederates are here in force. Because the Confederates are here in force, they're actually going to fell Lytle in his attack. Lytle's horse will ride towards the Confederates. It'll be captured. All of his baggage will be captured. And Lytle himself will be taken to this witness uh, of the battle, and that'll be the Patterson House or the Patterson House itself. That's where he is going to be uh, taken inside of that house. He'll be tended to Lytle, future Union general. Now, we know where the Confederates are. What do we do for William Rosecrans? He's a general. He is a West Point graduate of the class of 1841. He has succeeded George McClellan, who is now in command of all Union forces. Remember, McClellan did very well. McClellan did very well at, at Rich Mountain. And uh, Rosecrans will be left in command after the Union debacle at First Bull Run or First Manassas, whatever you want to call it. McClellan goes east. Rosecrans takes over the operations here in, in Western Virginia. Rosecrans will start to push his men forward, make contact with the Confederates. Now, the Confederates uh, know the Union Army is here. They are, going to, uh, they are going to stay where they are and allow the Union forces to start attacking on my left. The camera's right. Coming down through here will be Henry Benham's brigade, mostly Ohioans, moving down through this field, past the Pattinson House, uh, Patterson House, and going up towards the Confederate lines. Those attacks will be repulsed. Union cannon up on top of the ridge line, which is not going to be very far from the Confederates, will start to bombard the Confederate lines. That they will have some direct hits on the logs, according to the Union forces. Some Confederates said the Union the Union cannon were overshooting them. You know, it's probably a mixture of the two. But Benham's brigade will start attacking across here piecemeal fashion. And I was trying to to spare. Uh, Gary, who's behind the camera as it's raining here, and took off his raincoat right before it happened <laughs> uh, under a tree here. Uh, to, to talk just for a second, there's some great interpretive signs. These are newish. Uh, they've been up here not too long. But this is going to be to the Colonel John Lowe, talking about the 12th Ohio Infantry who attacked across here. And he's going to be the first field grade officer. A field grade officer is a major, a lieutenant colonel, or a colonel who is killed in action during the Civil War from the state of Ohio, and Ohio is going to send the third most troops to the Union cause, only behind New York and Pennsylvania. So these Ohioans are going to be attacking across this field. They're going to surge towards and past the Patterson House. They're going to be going towards the Confederate lines. And things seem to be going okay for the Union forces, because, well, we have more men. 
We have Venom's Brigade going forward. Venom's a West Point graduate. He knows what he's doing. He won the Battle of Corks Ford for us, which took all about six minutes, but he won that battle nonetheless. Venom, though, is going to be repulsed. He's going to be repulsed as his men make piecemeal fashion attacks towards the Confederate lines, towards Carnifex Ferry itself, towards the Gauley River. So as we get down here towards the, the Patterson House, which I'm going to give Gary a second here, um, you'll start to see this 1850s structure. If we can pan off in this direction, Gary. Um, you'll see this is the 1850s structure. Uh, it is a witness to war on the interior. There are bullet holes, uh, so this had damage inside of it. Obviously, the clapboard on the outside of it has been replaced over the years. Some Union soldiers will say this is a log house at the time. Others say it's a, a, a clapboard house like this. Um, I've seen one uh, study that said that it was probably a log house with clapboards added on prior to the battle. So this is a good representation of what would have been here uh, uh, high above the Gauley River. So the Union forces are starting to run into problems. Uh, they're attacking up into those woods right behind me. That's where the Confederate line is. They're not far from where we are. And as the Union forces um, who would be, or the Confederate forces who would be fronting us uh, over here, would have been the 45th Virginia Infantry, uh, amongst others. But across the park road today, we have a hollow. This is Pearson's Hollow down below us. And you notice it's a hollow. This hasn't changed since the, the time of the Civil War. So what the uh, Union forces will try to do is bring up a new brigade, a second brigade. This will be commanded by Colonel Robert McCook. He is one of the 17 fighting McCooks. Robert is a colonel at this time but Robert will eventually rise to a general, as you would guess. Uh, and McCook uh, is out here, he's conspicuous because he's actually in civilian garb, in a big civilian hat. He looks like he should be a newspaper reporter or a businessman rather than being a colonel, but he's auspicious. He's commanded the 9th Ohio Infantry. 9th Ohio is gonna see a lot of action um, uh, during the Civil War and McCook will eventually uh, be essentially murdered by Confederate guerrillas uh, during the Perryville campaign or in the midst of the Perryville campaign as he's riding in a wagon. Um, so coming down through this hollow will be more Ohio regiments. These Ohio regiments will include the 23rd Ohio amongst others with Rutherford B. Hayes and William McKinley. Uh, but as they get down there with, I believe the 12th Ohio infantry, you do this without notes, uh, they're going to <laughs> accidentally start firing upon one another. So we have a friendly fire incident that will start to take place as they try to go around the Confederate right flank through that hollow that runs up to this high ground. If you see the high ground, that is where we're going to deal with the Confederates. This is a, a very compact battlefield. When you start talking about Napoleonic battles, when they get in within 100 yards or so of one another, um, it's a little wider than that. But this is a very compact battlefield. So we're going to try to get McCook around the right. We're going to take Benham around the left, dealing with mainly the 45th Virginia. Uh, uh, on the right, as Gary back, goes back and forth, we'll have the 22nd Virginia Infantry. That was commanded by uh, George Patton Sr., Patton Sr.'s wounded at the Battle of Scary Creek, so he's not here at the ba at the battle. Uh, but you'll have other units over there, commanded by Gabriel Wharton, future Confederate general. Uh, he has the uh, 50th and 51st Virginia, I believe, with him up here. Uh, and these Confederates, everything seems to be coming up aces for them. Because as these Union forces are attacking up this slight rise, they're coming up towards what was called Camp Gauley. This would be the Confederate position. Uh, the camp above the Gauley River. This was established after Kessler's Cross Lanes on August 26th. This is where Floyd is sitting and enticing uh, William Rosecrans and uh, Jacob Cox and other uh, Union commanders to attack down here. Now, Floyd, he's inflicting a, a good amount of casualties on the Union forces, but his men uh, are in a no-win position. He's got about 1,700 men to 1,800 men under his command. Some say about as many as 2,000. Regardless, there are 7,000 Yankees coming down upon him. And these Federals will be attacking, luckily for Floyd, in piecemeal fashion. Remember at this point, Rosecrans, Floyd, and others are still learning the ways of war. Some of them do have training. Some of them do have Me uh, Mexican-American war experience or fighting on the plains experience, but it's still nonetheless. They've never commanded this many men in their lives. This is something I like to tell folks on tours. Think about, you know, when you go from being Richard Yule, 
who's commanded 120 men in his life. Now at Gettysburg, he's commanding almost 20,000 men. Uh, you know, what's going to prepare you for that? Not a lot. William T. Sherman talks about before the Battle of First Manassas, him pulling out the field manual of remembering how to take a regiment or a brigade from a line of march into column. So it's like reading a manual of your book uh, or of your car's owner's manual, figuring, all right, these guys go from here to here to here, and this is how I do it. So we're still learning a lot. But Floyd really uh, is in an open situation as the battle unfolds throughout the day. Union forces will keep attacking up through this plain, piecemeal fashion, as I mentioned. But the Confederates will be in behind, if you can see those, Gary, uh, some reconstructed works. These are not the original works, but they'll be behind earthworks that are going to give them the protection. These will run, these Confederate works will run for about 350 to 400 feet. They will turn back towards the Gully River uh, on the Confederate right-hand side. Um, they will actually be double enforced. That'll be on Gabriel Wharton's side. So they'll have a double line there just in case. That's going to protect the ferry road. Carnifex Ferry is less than a mile from where I'm standing, and that is your escape route if you're John Floyd, down and across the Gully River. Uh, so the Confederates will hold out. Rosecrans will eventually peter out his forces as the, the um, attack goes on throughout the day because uh, the men are worn out. If you drive through this country, you know it's hard to get from point A to point B. So marching through this country makes it even worse. So now on September the 11th, Rosecrans is going to go in for the kill, but Floyd finally makes a prudent decision and he is going to pull back across the Gully River starting on the evening of the 10th. He realizes he's in a terrible position. He's going to pull back down and across the Gully River and he is going to use that as a natural defensive barrier. The Confederates will claim this is a victory. Uh, Rosecrans will claim this is a victory. Technically, the Confederates uh, win on September 10th but they leave the field to Rosecrans and under 19th century warfare, whoever holds the field wins the day. So Rosecrans will be victorious. Uh, Floyd will send his own praise, praising himself back to Richmond, uh, talking about the great victory here, but uh, being pushed back south across the Gully River, the failed assault up the Elk Water, the failed assault at Cheap Mountain is really going to bring a disastrous, disastrous 1861 to a conclusion uh, here in Western Virginia. And that is really going to help secure the, uh, the what will become the state of West Virginia statehood because we have now really pushed the Confederates back deep across the Gali. The Kanawha River, spelled Kanawha, around Charleston is falling under Union control. It'll fall back under Confederate control for a while in 62, but come back into the Union. And these 32, eventually 34, and then eventually 55 counties that will uh, consist of West Virginia, its statehood will be solidified on battlefields like uh, Carnifex Ferry, uh, Corix Ford, Rich, Cheat, Mountains, and Philippi. Um, so as well as the Confederates are doing in the Eastern Theater, which seems to be the focus of most people in 1861 and throughout the war, things going on out west, uh, even though we're not very far west, are going to start to snowball and the confederacy is going to start shrinking in and around itself uh, because shortly after this we'll have the falls of forts henry and donelson the vic union victory at shiloh the fall of new orleans and things will start to go poorly and now we have a massive chunk of the state of virginia turning itself into a union state and that is going to help uh, bring supplies men and materiel uh, further into the balance of the north uh, and with that, what I'm going to do is close off our Carnifex Ferry coverage. We had about 30 Confederate casualties up here. We had about 130 Union casualties up at Carnifex Ferry. Technically, it's a Union victory. Confederates can probably claim it as well. But I'm going to get Gary Edelman out of the rain. Uh, and with that, say thank you for watching this. Please share this with your friends, with your family. Uh, share this with a teacher that you know. These are, are always used by teachers uh, across the, the U.S. Um, and... We hope that you head over to battlefields.org where you'll learn more about what we do as the American Battlefield Trust. Hopefully you'll click that donate button, become a member, and maybe you will help to support another one of these Western video swings or another video swing elsewhere. I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust. Thank you for watching and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation.